Hello and welcome to our midday coming to you live on the web on social media from our digital studio inside the local four compound downtown Detroit. Of course, you could be watching this anywhere and travel here for Sunday's walk for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. And on that note, I'd like to introduce our special guest today in studio, Jillian Ripalone, founder of T1D Chick, which I would assume is type 1 diabetes. Yes. All right, uh, Jillian is the founder of T1D Chick, has type 1 di diabetes, and is a patient advocate. She was a speaker at the JDRF's Type 1 Nation Summit this past spring and has been using her social platforms to raise awareness for type 1 diabetes. And you have a fairly vast <laughs> network. Also seated to her right, we have Ryan Dinkrave. He is a JDRF board member. Uh, he has type 1 diabetes and has been incredibly outspoken about the challenges of insulin pricing, uh, which brings us to the crux or the hallmark moment of today's uh, midday, and that is the fact that right now, if I had type 1 diabetes, it would cost me roughly 100 bucks a week to treat it, whereas if I were to go over to Canada, go through the tunnel or over the bridge, it would be a fraction of that. In fact, you recently did something with Bernie Sanders that was related specifically to that. Yes, this was actually my third caravan to Canada um, and this third one in July I went with Bernie Sanders okay. and a bunch of type 1 diabetics um, in the Detroit metro based area to go to insulin to get to go to Canada to get insulin. So this vial of insulin right here um, retail price right now this is 360 a vial. Okay. Some diabetics need between two and four a month. So, Ooh. yeah, and the issue is That's people... Like fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars Yeah, person. and in Canada, it's one-tenth of the price. So you can get the same vial of insulin made by the same manufacturer um, for about $26 a vial. Or and about 150 So it's like one-tenth the cost. Yes, so you can go right into any pharmacy in Canada and say, I'm a type 1 diabetic, I need insulin, and there's no questions asked. You don't need a prescription. You can just go and get it, like, over the counter. Okay, so that, as a layperson, we're going to get into um, diabetes, the disease itself, and insulin and, sh and sugar and all that. But right off the gate, or right out of the gate, I'm thinking of like the Sackler family and how they became wealthy off of opioids. Who's getting wealthy off of uh, expensive insulin? That's kind of like a vast because it's the pharmaceutical companies. Um, I believe they make about 220, is it billion dollars a year? Um, and then you kind of have like like it, it's like broken up so everyone gets like a piece of that so you kind of have like um, the PBMs you have the pharmacies you have who all these manufacturers are paying off um, and supporting so I feel like that's kind of a difficult question. Ryan? No, type 1 diabetes is a huge uh, cost I think it's the leading di diabetes is the leading uh, medical expense by you know type of condition and uh, it yeah, that's it's it's we can't live without insulin. So being able to afford it, it's not it's a life or death choice, frankly. Literally, because if you've been following the headlines, there are people who are literally dropping dead because they are not managing uh, their disease because they can't afford to. They are making a literal life and death death choice by not taking their insulin or trying to spread it out, ration it because it's so expensive. And at 26 years old, you're kicked off your parents' insurance, so you kind of have that time where you have to figure out how much how much insurance is going to be. And when you're kind of like young and you're 26, trying to still figure it out, when you pay rent and you pay bills, everything else, um, insulin, it could be very expensive, your medical. Do you know of any diabetics who have literally moved to Mexico or to Canada because they can afford their medication there as opposed to living here? I don't, but that's an interesting question because we're, we're already crossing the border to get insulin at some point. It's such a big part of your life. And if you live in a place like Detroit where it is Convenient. this accessible, yeah, I, I would imagine some people considering something like that. But and I also think this is going to be a very short-term solution because Canada is not the solution. We shouldn't right. have to cross a border into another country to get insulin because we can't get it here in America, um, you know, home of the free. <laughs> the richest country in the history of the world. I mean, it was, it was insane to me when this issue first came up to hear that, there were that the price of insulin, something we've had around for so long, has not really changed in dramatic ways in a long time was going up and it was becoming unaffordable for people. It was just unfathomable. 
Okay, so let's walk it back a bit and get into what diabetes, the disease is. I mean, anybody of a certain age grew up looking at TV commercials, Wilfred Brimley would be talking about his diabetes. <laughs> uh, we've heard other people refer to it as the sugars or what have you. It, it, but it's, you know, it's not something that, you know, is pop culture, culture fodder. It is literally a potentially deadly disease. What is diabetes? So I think of it as, think of it like you, you're functioning, right, because you have everything that you need. But my body, I have a broken pancreas. So everyone makes a hormone called insulin, but my body just stopped producing it for whatever reason. So I was diagnosed at seven years old. My brother was diagnosed at, uh, we were a year apart when we were diagnosed. And there's no family history of type 1 diabetes. Then you have people that get diabetes, whether they're juvenile or later adult. It can happen at any time, any religion, any race, because diabetes does not discriminate. Yeah, and with type 1 diabetes, your, your body's making zero insulin. That's the difference. Which, type, what does the body do with insulin? Insulin is, if I, I think of it as the key that unlocks uh, your cells, so the sugar in your blood sugar in your blood that's from the food you eat can go into your cells and be used for energy. So without that, sugar builds up in your blood. Your body then starts burning fat for energy, which is very toxic, frankly, to the body. So you need to take injections of insulin or deliver it through an insulin pump. So you're managing the sugar. Yep. You love the level yep. of sugar in your blood. We are... We have, to, we have to operate our pancreas manually because it's broken. And if you don't get enough insulin that you need, which comes in this little vial, um, then you'll go into DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is, I think, I like to tell people, think about a fish out of water. If a fish doesn't get back in w water, what happens? It, it sucks out everything you have, right. and which leads to death. Now, if your sugar level is too low, what's the symptom? Shaky, you get very shaky. Um, you start to lose your vision a little bit and your surroundings, um, and you kind of could slip into like an unconscious state because oh, yeah. your body is getting maybe too much insulin mm -hmm. and you're not getting enough sugar to offset that. Okay, so that's low blood sugar. What about a high blood sugar? High blood sugar, I feel like you're very dry mouth, you're lethargic um, mm -hmm. because you have, you have this astronomical high blood sugar and you're not getting enough insulin to offset that. So it's constantly like the struggle to find that perfect balance to keep you at a healthy, at a healthy uh, state. Ryan, how many times a day do you have to manage your, be your own pa pancreas basically? Yeah. Well, I, I'm probably all day long to be honest and thankfully I have an insulin pump now that every five minutes is making a calculation based on a blood sugar reading it's getting from me every five minutes from a device I'm wearing of how much a little dose of insulin to give me to manage it all trying to get to 120 milligrams per deciliter of, of blood sugar all so day it's like long. like a wearable pancreas? In a way but, it it's, but it doesn't do it all on its own you still have to tell it when you eat how much you eat if I'm gonna go out uh, kayaking or hiking or something, I have to tell it, okay, target a higher number because I don't want you to then make me low. Hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, is the real emergency. Hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, you feel like garbage, mm -hmm. but you'll be, you can, you can tolerate that for a while. You can't stay, your blood sugar stays low, low, low. You go into a coma, you may die. But the reality is too, while Ryan and I both have um, insulin pumps oh, and continue, this is my right insulin pump that gives me my insulin 24 hours a day. I also wear a Dexcom CGM device, okay. which gives me my blood sugar reading every five minutes, which eliminates the finger pokes. However, most diabetics don't have those options. So while we have those options, we're considered privileged, but most diabetics do not. Did insurance cover those for you? Insurance, and everyone's insurance is different, so everyone doesn't realize that, but you have different co-pays, different deductibles. So while my insurance might cover, let's say, 80%, Maybe Ryan's, maybe it doesn't cover as much, or maybe it covers all of it. Well, and what if there's a, th uh, let's just say there's a third person sitting here named John, and John mm -hmm. recently lost his job and his health insurance. And, uh, uh, John would not be able to afford his insulin pump or CGM. And it puts him, his life at risk. 100% because if he's not getting this, which is the important part, which is insulin, then he would go into DKA due to probably insulin rationing and would cause death. And your point about employment is huge. Once you do not have health insurance, and you don't have continuous health, good health insurance, you can't maintain the kind of tools that we're able to use. So it's a huge purchase up front, but you know, we were talking about this recently that people want to donate a used pump or something to somebody else that they can use, but it's not really worth, it's kind of worthless because they can't afford the supplies. The supplies are prohibitively expensive if you don't have health and insurance. And people are turning to the diabetes black market. 
um, and what it sounds. Uh, there is such a thing. <laughs> yes, because I run it. <laughs> well, so you think would about, know that. <laughs> think about think about it like this: there's something that people want and they can't get, right? So if you need this to survive and you can't get it, you're going to go to the most extreme measures to get this life-saving medication. So people all over the world will come to me and if and just people in the community and say, hey, I have extra insulin this month. I would like to donate it to someone that does not. And it's not, it's And a, there's no, it's, it's no. It's not a narcotic or an illegal substance. It's something that you can. There, there are fine lies, uh, lines and legalities. However, when it comes to if Ryan didn't have insulin, I would give Ryan insulin to save his life. Okay. But what about supplying him on the market? Well, you, it, you, you hope want, it's a temporary it's, it's thing. It's a touchy, it's a, it's a very sensitive situation, but when you have families out there that have two or three kids with diabetes and they have to go to Canada, or if they're not able to, let's say, mm -hmm. to go to Canada or Mexico, where are they going to get their insulin from? So everyone in the community comes together and they'll help rat, like give extra donations that they're just unused insulin, unused supplies to help somebody in need in life and death situations. It's a patchwork solution. Right? Kristen Smith on Facebook uh, says, this is a real-time conversation. Obviously, we have people watching all over the place. Uh, she says, I wish I could be on the show and explain it better. High blood, pr high blood sugar is very dangerous, too. Your organs start to get damaged with high blood sugars, right? Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. I only meant that, like, if I, my, my blood sugar is high today, I can make it till tomorrow. I'm not gonna. I'm most likely not gonna have a crisis. Whereas blo low blood sugar must be treated immediately. So I would imagine this is a real burden on your diet. You have to be very careful about what you eat or when you intake certain. I try to. I try to tell people it's a balance. There's nothing that you can't eat. But I wouldn't go out and have um, 12 donuts. Maybe I would have one donut or maybe half at a time. Okay. Make sure my blood sugars are balanced, and then maybe go on to have something else at a later time. But I think diabetes, when it comes to eating, is, is definitely a balance. I agree. I, I mean, there's, there's things I could have, like I could have a regular soda if I wanted, but uh, I would have to take insulin for it and make my blood sugar go up, and you know, I have to make sure it comes back down. It's just not worth it to me, um, so I, I don't, but I certainly could. There's nothing we absolutely can't have, uh, just like anyone having a good balanced diet is healthy. Okay, so is the, maybe a dumb question, but you know, if you're a layperson like me, then I guess there are no dumb questions. Every month, uh, my credit card is charged 20 bucks for St. Jude's Hospital. Uh, is there anything like that for the, the JDRF that, that people could like, just donate money every month so people can buy their insulin? Ab well, um, for JDRF, I know we, we raise money for uh, a whole range of activities, including the biggest thing for curing diabetes, but also for these kind of uh, advancements. But JDRF is really focused on the advocacy aspect for the insulin affordability, so pressuring the companies to do everything, the manufacturers to do everything they can to lower prices, the benefits, coordinators, uh, all along, and, and employers, frankly, to pick the strongest. But yes, insurance. you can, if you go online on the jdrf.org website, there is a donation button, so you can always donate and you can make it reoccurring if you would like to. But you're saying it's used for research more so than procuring insulin. I don't think we have a restricted fund for procuring insulin for people. Does anybody? Is That's there a 501c3 or anything? I don't, I don't, not that I'm aware of. I think kind of the... There are certain legalities with organizations, so unfortunately um, I wouldn't be able to donate this to the organization. Um, they can find people maybe in the community, but because of, because of having a prescription, there, there are so many legalities with the nonprofits, so you can't just directly give certain organizations um, insulin. But there are organizations out there that you can. All right, so getting back to, I mean, there are comments on here on our Facebook, the live feed, about the pharmaceutical big pharma. Uh, how much are they to blame for this, and how much of this can they control? Could they, I mean, if it's only $100 for one of these in Canada, could the big pharma here in this country make that $100 if they wanted to? They could, but they choose not to because of greed Why? and corruption. Greed, greed yeah. and corruption. They're set up as businesses to make money. Um, that, that, that's, that's the profit motive. So why, why do we care? I mean, obviously, we know why we care, but, it, you know, a, tur a turn of phrase, why do we care about op opioids and prosecuting uh, Sackler family for their misdeeds or their uh, greed, but we, we, don't, we can't see this problem in, with those same kind of glasses? So big, ph uh, big Pharma consists of, like, three major companies. You have Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk, and Sanofi. They make up 90% um, of the world's insulin. Okay. So when you're talking about billions and billions of dollars and payoffs, um, I feel like Big Pharma almost runs the country because of all that. 
So they are donating, donating to people's campaigns. They're donating money to organizations to help run programs, right? So and then there's this blame game. So everyone has to blame each other. Like big pharmaceutical companies are saying, oh no, it's insurance. And insurance is saying, no, it's you. And then they're blaming the PDMs. And then, so the you PDMs. have of the, um, do you want to get into the? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so you have like, you kind of have like the middleman. I like to call it like the middleman, right? Okay. Right, that makes like all like the negotiations. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have like the pharmaceutical companies talking to like the PBMs and then you have them that are kind of like you have like all these different arrows and they kind of make up like what I guess Every your week. insurance would your what your co-pays would be your addition your insurance would be this sounds like collusion <laughs> <laughs> well there's like this this web and the issue is it's coming down to the main source so as patient advocates that's what we're doing right now we're trying to fight for affordable insulin and insulin for all uh, what's good? There's an event coming up on Sunday. Um, how does that dovetail into what we've been talking about thus far? Yeah, JD, you're off. You have the one walk, which will be taking place this Sunday, the 22nd, at the Mellican State Park. Um, and check-in begins at 8:30, and it starts at 9:30. And what this walk is, you have everyone. Um, you have type one diabetics, all ages. You have supporters and caregivers, and we all come together as a community. And that's what's so important because until there is a cure, mm -hmm. we have community, and that's what we need. We need to be able to get together, and we can share our stories and walk together. It's our biggest public fundraiser event of the year, every year, and it goes to funding all the activities that I mentioned earlier, including research for curing type 1 diabetes, also uh, new insulins, new uh, products, new technologies for making life better and more tolerable, frankly, uh, as a type 1 diabetic until there is a cure, and uh, trying to prevent um, complications from diabetes later in life. And then finally, uh, prevention, looking to uh, find a, a way to prevent a vaccine, if, if you will, for uh, type 1 diabetes. Is it possible to, uh, as an adult, develop diabetes because of, I don't know, uh, poor diet or, or poor life choices or that's whatever, and then actually come back out of it? Or once you have it, you got it, and that's it? My, my understanding is once you are diagnosed, <coughs> you are diabetic. And, but yes, that would be what you're talking about is generally type two, more uh, behavioral influence, but there's also a genetic component, component to that. Whereas with us, type one, we're I think less than 10% of the diabetic, maybe it's 5% of the mm -hmm. population. We uh, are zero insulin production at all, and it's entirely um, you know, uh, not behavioral. There is no cure for type one diabetes, and that's why we have organizations, and that's why we do this walk to bring together the community and raise money, because hopefully this money that we all raise, that all goes towards research to finding the cure. And one of my roles often at, at the walks is being out there asking people to sign the petitions for things like insulin affordability. I noticed that you have a smartwatch on, and yes. you're wearing, the, what do you call this? This is my insulin pump, the Omnipod. Okay, now, uh, earlier I, off camera, I mentioned that I had heard that there's something like an external pancreas, like almost like a mechanical pancreas that you run your belt with like a clip on. Mm -hmm. uh, is that close <laughs> to market or in That's, state? well, this is, I mean, that what I have is an insulin pump, and that's what you might call a early uh, version of what we call the artificial pancreas. It still relies on me telling it things that I'm doing, telling it when I'm eating, telling it when I'm exercising. So it's not what we could call a closed loop. Is there loop. a passive one in development? They are working towards that where because, you know, it would be very minimal. Because FDA requires all these requirements that it's, it's kind of like a slow process. So while you have the do-it-yourself, right, of making your own, um, kind of like running your own um, insulin pump, that's what I'm doing, I'm looping right now, but that is something that I'm doing on my own. That's what Geniuses kind of came up with. However, because of FDA, there's all like these certain qualifications and processes to get to that point. So for big companies like Medtronic, Omnipod, Tandem, it's gonna take a little while to get FDA approval. Now, uh, full disclosure, a family member of mine uh, worked for a pharmaceutical company, a smaller one that was acquired by Sanofi? Sanofi. Sanofi. Um, and the product that they were working on at one point, this is like 10, 15 years ago, was inhalable insulin. Now, I know that it had been tried once prior and it didn't work. I'm using that as well right now. And so, so mm -hmm. you were using inhaled? So, mankind makes a Frezza, and a Frezza is an inhaled insulin. So, I think of it more as like a supplemental because I'll always need long acting insulin. Full disclosure, I'm a man, <laughs> mankind stockholder. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, this <laughs> doesn't come up later. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so the Afreza is for short acting. Okay. So no matter what, you still need your long acting insulin. So okay. it's more of like, I would say a supplemental. 
This does make me a little nervous. Uh, I get a little um, uh, <laughs> flushed when I, I get this close to these <laughs> kind of needles. I, I, are we ever going to get away from this? Not, maybe not right now, but eventually because of the advancements of technology. I mean, back in the day, I never had this. When I was seven years mm -hmm. old, my right. brother, uh, we were just giving. Did you have to do the, the finger We were giving ourselves, yeah, Still fingerprints, but we were also using <laughs> just syringes to give our insulin. So with the advancements with technology, now we're filling our needles um, with the insulin using a syringe. However, you're inserting the insulin into this device, which is your insulin pump. And now I kind of have this insulin pump ah, on me okay. 24 hours a day, giving gotcha. myself insulin versus taking 10 shots a day. Whew. <laughs> I can't even imagine. It's like one every two hours that you're awake. Um, where can somebody find out more information about the walk, about donating, about uh, campaigning, calling their senators, calling their uh, representatives about this uh, out of control cost for insulin? Where can they, is there a sort of one place they can go and get all that started? The best place to go is www.jdrf.org. You'll find information on all the uh, advocacy activities. You can find information on all the interesting research going on. There's all kinds of interesting products in development that actually JDRF has helped fund in some cases. And you can find our chapter on there, our Michigan chapter, and information about the uh, Detroit Walk and on Facebook. Uh, and also, the walk itself, uh, the, again, jdrf.org? Yep. Yes, yep, jdrf.org, and it'll be this Sunday yep. um, at the Melican State Park. And where do the good people find either one or both <laughs> of you on social media? On social media, my Instagram and Facebook page is T1D Chick. T1D Chick, and you? I'm the only Ryan Dinkrave on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it is an unusual name. You don't that so often. Uh, anything else that we need to get to, Sarah and or Matt? We're all good? All right, I think we, we've learned a lot here today. I know I have, and uh, on behalf of these two, thank you for joining us and do your part. Thank you. Thanks.